Well, good morning, Second Baptist Church. How is everybody this morning? It's so good to see you. Glad that you are here. I have escaped from prison, apparently. I don't know what that was all about, um, but I have escaped from prison, and I am back, and it's so good to be back in the house of the Lord with God's people ready to worship this morning. I'm glad that you are here. If you're a guest with us, uh, we just want to say welcome to you. You can get your phone out and text the word FIRST to 417-222-3388, and we will send you a little bit of a sweet treat. We would love to have a record of your attendance this morning. If you got your bulletin, everybody wave your bulletin at me. Yoo-hoo! It's good to see. All right, you got it. Awesome. On the bottom of that bulletin is a connect card, and if you're a first or second time guest with us, we want you to fill that out uh, and, and put it in the offering plate on the way out, or you can take it to our guest services center outside in the atrium, and we just want to say hello to you. Also, there's a place for prayer requests on there, and we would ask that, that everybody write a prayer request down. Whatever God's doing in your heart today or something that is of concern to you, we would love uh, to be able to know what that is and to pray for you. Our pastor is away at a conference this week, and so we have a guest speaker with us whose name is Mark Edworthy, and him and uh, Pastor John are friends, um, and they have been working together for, for, a, for a little while. And Mark is a, uh, a former IMB missionary, was on the field for about 30 years, is that right? And uh, is now a church planner in Missouri City, Texas. So it is appropriate this morning that he is here in the state of Missouri to bring the word of God to us, and I promise you, you are going to be blessed by uh, what God is doing in that part of, of our nation, and you're going to be blessed by what God is doing at City Rise Church down in Missouri City, Texas. So make sure that you pay attention and take a lot of notes, because God's doing some really, really, really great things. He's going to come up in just a little while and bring the word of God to us. We've got a lot going on at Second Baptist Church, and your bulletin gives you all the information you need. We've got a, a tiny town fall festival coming up this week, October 21st. Family dedication next Sunday morning. Man, that's a, that's a great opportunity for us to dedicate babies and uh, young children to the Lord, and, uh, and it's all part of our, our new parent pathway that we've got going on. It's an exciting time to be a member of Second Baptist Church. Also, ladies, Fresh Grounded Faith's coming up at the beginning of next month. You can get your tickets out in the atrium today. Be a part of that. We get to lead worship this year. Uh, our own praise team, our own worship team gets to lead worship on Friday night. It's going to be a great, great event. I cannot wait to be a part of that, and we've been praying for that for quite some time, so you're going to want to take, uh, take part in that. We are so grateful for those of you that are joining us online this morning. We want to say God bless you, and it's time to worship. Are you ready? So I want you to stand, and we're going to pray, and then we're going to, we're going to get after it this morning. We're going to be grateful to the Lord because he is a way maker. He is a miracle worker. He is a promise keeper, and because of the blood of Jesus Christ, you and I have great hope this morning. Amen. Let's, let's uh, pray together. Father, we are grateful today for your gift of mercy and your gift of grace. Father, we come before you this morning as a people that are ready to experience your presence in a profound way. We come before you this morning as a people that are grateful for the blood of Christ. People that are grateful that we can be called children of the Most High God. We come before you this morning, Father, anxious to see what you will teach us this morning, what you will do in our midst today. Father, we pray for our pastor this morning as he is away um, with a, at a conference, God, just being uh, rejuvenated and, and rested up, Father, we pray, God, this morning that you will bless him and his sweet wife today as they are taking some time off. God, we pray that, that you will bless us this morning, that you will fill us with your, with your spirit, Father. We pray this morning, God, that we would worship you in spirit, that our hearts, in tune with your heart, Father, would commune with Jesus, would commune with God the Father this morning. We pray, Father, that we would hear truth as we sing truth as we hear the word of God this morning, God, and that our hearts would be changed, that we would be drawn closer to you, and that we will lift you up this morning, Father. We are excited to worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. Are you grateful for Jesus and the blood of Christ this morning? Let's put our hands together and worship. Whatever comes, I won't complain. For all my hope is in your name, and now your joy awaits my praise. I give thanks for all. I'm 
set my feet on higher ground. So here I stand. You are my God. Your faithfulness, my solid rock. Believers should be marked with gratefulness. We should be marked with thankfulness. We should be the most thankful people that walk the planet because, number one, it's written all over the Bible. Gratefulness to the Lord. Thankfulness to God is written all over the scriptures, Old and New Testament. But we should be grateful this morning because of what Christ has done in us and what he's doing through us this morning. We have a lot of things going on in our world. Craziness is happening all over the place. Um, in your own personal life, chaos here, chaos there, coming, in, coming out of a storm, going into a storm, in the middle of a storm, whatever it is. But we are to count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Because the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Listen to what the Word of God says in Psalm 138. I will give you thanks with all my heart. I will sing praises before the gods. I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your mercy and your truth. For you have made your word great according to all. On the day I called, you answered me. You made me bold with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth will give thanks to you, Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. And here's verse 5. And they will sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For the Lord is exalted, yet he looks after the lowly, but he knows the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will reach out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. 
Your faithfulness, O oh God, is everlasting. Do not abandon the works of your hands. He is faithful to you this morning. Give thanks to him. Let's sing this morning of the ways of the Lord. Amen. Lift your voice with us today. Father, we are excited this morning to sing of our way maker, our promise keeper. We worship you this morning, God, in spirit and in truth. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you.
never stop. You never stop working. Come on, sing it. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. Come on, choir, sing it. Stop working. Even when I don't see it. up against the wall this morning and you don't see a way out, he's a way maker. If you're waiting on a promise from the Lord, he's a promise keeper today. You've been praying for a child, you've been praying for a friend, you've been praying for salvation for somebody, he's a promise keeper. You keep praying. If you're down and out today, he is a way maker. He has purchased salvation for you and for me. Let's, let's just own that this morning. Let's just believe that in our hearts. Let's, let's worship the Lord because he is a way maker. Let's worship the Lord because he's brought us out of darkness into light. He's removed your sin and your guilt from you this morning. Let's worship the Lord. Let's thank him for the blood of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. Let's continue to worship.
took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sin. this morning that gives us hope, that gives us freedom, that gives us peace, that is mercy, that is grace for the shed blood of Jesus Christ, for the remission of our sin, for the removal of our guilt that has washed us white as snow. We are grateful this morning, God. You are too kind, Lord, to mess with us humans. But Father, you have chosen through the passage of time to send your son Jesus Christ the perfect spotless lamb to pay the price he lived a perfect life he paid the price for our sin on that cross was buried and three days later rose victorious that we might have life that we might walk in freedom we might have victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave. God, we are grateful this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. And it's in your great name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Hey, church family, it's Pastor John, and it's my privilege to introduce to you Mark Edworthy. Mark and his wife Susie are career missionaries with the International Mission Board. They've recently returned stateside to begin a new work in church planting in Texas. 
We're excited to be able to have them with us here today and to be able to support the work that God is doing in their area of ministry. Would you give a warm Second Baptist welcome to Mark Edworthy? Well, it is a joy to be with you this morning. I hate that John's not here, but I appreciate his trust. I met him four or five years ago in his previous church. They brought groups to Krakow, Poland, where we served. Actually, we opened the work in Poland way back in 1991. We were the first, back then, foreign mission board, now international mission board missionaries, to go to that country, still under communism, when we arrived with three little preschool kids, uh, and we added two Polish kids via adoption, and uh, the Lord gave an amazing adventure to see firsts in that part of the world. In fact, it was a church not unlike this church that sent a, a team, as many churches do, but they sent a team to South Africa. And this was several years ago, and they got to South Africa, and their assignment was to pair up and get with a, an interpreter to, uh, to translate as they were going into this very impoverished area of town, a shanty town, basically, to share the good news. And so they got in these groups of two or three, and they began to go through. In fact, there were no streets. There really weren't even alleys. And they just leaned twos and, and discarded tin and cardboard. That's where the people lived. And they began to share the good news with them. And they had to devise a system, so they took little circle sticky notes, like you can get in the, uh, the office depot here. And when they would go and speak with someone, they'd put one color sticky note. If, quote, nobody was home, they'd put a second color. So as they began to weave their way through this shanty town, they could tell who'd been there or if someone had not yet been visited. Well, at the end of the day, a few people had actually responded to the gospel, so they were weary, but they were excited to see those who had said yes to the kingdom. And they were making their way down the dusty road to get in the van and to go to the air-conditioned hotel. And right before they got into the van, they heard someone shouting. And they looked up the, the road, and an elderly African man was shuffling toward them as fast as he could. And he was shouting something in his dialect. Of course, they couldn't understand him. But before they could even really discern what he was saying, they noticed the sticky note was on his forehead. And as he was shouting, finally one of the interpreters said, I understand what he's saying. He is saying, I want to be found. I want to be found. And as he made his way to that van, they got out, and they shared the simple good news with him, and, and that man received Christ that day. Friend, over a billion people on planet Earth want to be found. They've never heard. They've never said later. They've never said, I'll think about it. They never said, would you explain that to me? They've never heard one time the name of Jesus in a gospel presentation. And that's the challenge of the Great Commission. A couple years ago, before we anticipated coming back to the States, the health of our parents and other things prompted our, our move back after nearly 30 years with the International Mission Board. And, and honestly, I'm still going through reverse culture shock coming back to the city basically where I grew up there in greater Houston. And as, as I returned, I'm just fascinated by different things maybe than I used to be. And, and now it doesn't matter if I'm visiting a, a CEO in a Fortune 500 company or I'm at the Waffle House. Everybody has a vision statement. It's somewhere. In many churches, there's nothing wrong with that. And by definition, a vision statement is a projection of a preferred future. One year, three years, five years, whatever it may be. Well, this morning, I want to speak on the end vision. This is not a projection of a preferred future. This is a preview of a promised future. Do you remember as kids, sometimes there was that temptation to, to flip to the back of the book to see if the hero makes it? Well, we're going to go to the back of the book, and let me tell you that we win. Uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 7, we're going to see how this all culminates, how this all comes together. If you have your copy of, of God's Word or your device, I would ask you please to find the very last book, chapter 7. And, and again, you remember the context. Uh, John, the beloved apostle, probably the last living apostle there toward the end of the first century, exiled to the Isle of Patmos because of his testimony. It's just a rock of an island out there. And uh, there it says he's taken up in the Spirit. And he writes this amazing, apocalyptic, mystical Difficult sometimes to understand book. But when he gets to chapter 7 in verse 9, it really is crystal clear. Uh, he's just written to the 144,000. He gets to verse 9 in the scene shifts. He says, and after these things, I looked and behold, the multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands, and they cry out with a loud voice, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels 
were standing around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. My friend, that's how it ends. Every nation, all tribes, peoples, tongues, all ethnic groups, all tribal peoples, all people groups will be gathered around the throne. But don't miss this. That day is not this day. That day is not today. Because there are still hundreds of people groups waiting, still waiting for the gospel. We use the term UPG, unreached people group. We use UUPG, unengaged, unreached people groups. And they're waiting to be found they're, they're waiting for someone to cross a geographical barrier, a cultural barrier, a, a linguistic barrier. Friend, we've gotten to all the easy places, but they're hard ones. They're still waiting for us. Now, the, now the bad news is there's still hundreds of such groups. The good news is there's fewer today than there were 10 years ago. In fact, let me share about one of those people groups. It's an, an African context, a Muslim people group. And word reached our missionaries there that over this mountain range, there was this people group that had never been engaged with the gospel in the history of that people group. And so a church sent four volunteers to come help maybe bring engagement to that people group. And two missionaries packed them into a, a four by four and they, they drove as far as the road would go and then as far as the dirt would go. And then they went off road for a while and finally they had to park and they, they trekked over a mountain range into a clearing into a valley there, and there were huts there. There were several villages you could see as they came down from the mountain. And as they walked into the clearing, as the laws of hospitality in that culture would say, they were invited into two homes. So three went into one hut and three into another. In the first one, the missionary actually was a missionary kid. And so he grew up in that language. So he was fluent, just like my kids. And uh, he began to share the, the stories of the gospel. This is an illiterate people group. To hand them a Bible really wouldn't help. But from creation to Christ. And they were courteous. They were polite. They really weren't interested. But it was the second hut. This was a fairly new missionary, still struggling with the language, nervous, best he could. He began to tell the stories. And he got to the, the cross and the resurrection. And he turned to the man there and he said, do you want to receive God's free gift? And the man said, yes. Well, the missionary thought he didn't understand him. He said, I don't think you understand. Let me try again. And the man said, no, you don't understand. And there his little boy was playing in the dirt floor. And he turned to the missionary and he said, where you're standing four years ago, an angel stood and told me the next day my wife was going to give birth to a boy. And we were to name him Isa, which in their language means Jesus. And someday someone will tell you who Jesus is. You listen and you follow. I've been waiting four years for you to come. And this people group that never heard the gospel had their first believer, their first family, and their first church. That's what the Lord is doing even in our days. Now, Jesus said it would happen back in Matthew 24, 14. He said, in this gospel, the kingdom will be preached into the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now, I've heard people, I believe, mistranslate that to say somehow we can hold Jesus captive. If we quit sending missionaries, he can't come back because the gospel won't make it. Well, I don't believe we hold Jesus captive. I think, think he's being descriptive to say in God's economy, God's grace, he has so designed that the body of Christ will obey the Great Commission. But don't miss this. It may not be the American church. It may be Korean missionaries or Filipino or Nigerian or Brazilian but this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the nations. That is God's promise. And then the end will come. Well, what will the end look like? Well, look back at our passage this morning. Because it says an uncountable multitude. Now, narrow is the gate. We do know that. So not all will be saved. And only those who choose the Lord Jesus personally as Lord and Savior will enter the narrow gate. But the sum of the whole is a, an uncountable multitude. Uh, uh, again, this is a group of every nation. And so uh, uh, the church I've started, uh, we've started, is, is multi-ethnic. I'm the only Anglo on staff. I have two African-American uh, associate pastors part-time and then Hispanic. 
And, uh, and it, it is beautiful. And some people say, well, well God is colorblind, that uh, all that is going to drop away. Well, actually, the Bible says it won't. It says somehow in heaven we're going to be able to recognize there are different ethnic groups. And the beauty of that is it's a mosaic. God is actually honored more fully by the variety. It, it isn't just one appearance, one style, one anything. It is a multitude of all the nations gathered around the throne. And then it says they're clothed in white robes. Now, now why? What, what may that mean? Well, had I continued reading, if your Bible's open, look at verse 13. For it says, then one of the elders answered saying to me, these who are clothed in the white robes, who are they and where have they come from? And I said to him, my Lord, you know. And listen, he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. And the scholars debate, but most believe this is a group of all the redeemed of all the ages. All those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. From the Old Testament, New Testament, current day, and until our Lord returns. This is a gathering of all the saved, all the believers. And it says they're clothed in white robes. Interestingly, that's not the first mention of white robes. Again, if your Bible's open, look back one page. Uh, there in chapter 6. When the fifth seal is open in verse 9, let's read. It says, And when the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. He sees the martyrs, verse 10. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a, tell me, church, a white robe. And they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. Do you follow that? Okay, that, that's the second indication if you're counting. The first is this gospel of the kingdom will be preached into all the world. Okay? The second is when the last martyr is killed, the end will come. Well, what does that tell us, church? It tells us it will be costly to complete the great commission again we've gone to all the places that enjoy seeing the blue passport and now we're going to places underground we're going to places where it's very dangerous uh, again I hear some people refer to the age of the martyrs as that first century the catacombs Nero Domitian who's probably the emperor when John writes these words but please don't miss this we live in the age of the martyrs there have been more people killed for the Christian faith in the last hundred years than the 19th previous centuries combined. Did you hear that? 27 of my fellow workers with the Foreign Mission Board, International Mission Board, since its inception, have died a martyr's death. Recently, you've seen on the news, the Taliban just took Kabul again in Afghanistan. You may not know that literally a week or two before, it was clear to most people, that they were about to retake the capital, that Christian pastors went to the government office and registered their church, which is illegal. You cannot start a church. And yet they said, I want our children and grandchildren to know that we took a stand. And some of them have paid with their life over the last few weeks. We shouldn't be surprised, church. Uh, again, I worked for the board for several years, and I've had people call me to say, now you're not going to send my daughter into harm's way. And my response was, no, but God may. And he does. And he has. And so he must not shrink back. Uh, another story from North Africa. In a country where if you're born there, you're Muslim by birth. It's not a choice. And literally on the law books, if you convert to Christianity, they can impose capital punishment. Simply because you left the Muslim faith. And yet, in that country... There are thousands of Christians meeting underground secretively, knowing if they ever get caught, they literally will be imprisoned. It's just a question, will they be executed? A few years ago, the government captured one of the leaders of this house church network, and they tortured him for several days. They kept asking the same two questions. Who are the other leaders, and where do you meet? And he refused. They went to his village, and they brought his brother to the cell, and they put a gun to his brother's head and said, you tell us or he dies. And this pastor said, I'm sorry, and watched as they killed his brother. That's the reality. And so the question is, is it worth it, really? 
Is it, is it worth it? And, and the Bible on every page says, yes, it is. Even unto death. And on that day, we will all be in white robes. The next phrase is even more interesting. It says, and palm branches were in their hands. Now, I've got several degrees from seminaries, but I never remember the conversation, are there palm trees in heaven? So I don't know. But I do know there are palm branches in heaven because it says it right here. Why? Why would God reveal to John and through John to us this scene, uncountable multitude, white robes, holding palm branches? Well, again, where's John? He's on the Isle of Patmos. He's probably wondering some days, does this gospel really make it to the ends of the world? And in one split second, this vision, he sees them holding palm branches, and the answer is yes. Palm branches were a sign of victory. They were used in victory parades. You, you remember Palm Sunday, the Sunday prior to the crucifixion, our, our Lord entered, and they put down their cloaks and palm branches, said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. You may not remember, about 200 years before, there was another palm parade. That guy's name was Judas Maccabees, and he had overthrown the occupying government there. And as he entered Jerusalem, historians tell us that they put down palm branches, and he walked in as a victor. Uh, present day, I don't know. It's kind of scary to me to think it may be those styrofoam number ones that you see at the football games to say, we win. We're Number one, and what God is saying to John and through John to us is saying this gospel is victorious. I spent most of the last 12 years before leaving the field. I was the, the leader, the offended leader for all of Europe. I uh, traveled to all 40 countries and, and many other countries. And I'm ashamed to say it's usually in the States I have to remind the church the gospel is victorious. I have to remind the church God still heals God still breaks addictions. God still breaks chains. God is able. He still does it. Uh, it, it my responsibility included all Europeans, and, and I know they're not in Europe, but I was responsible for all the Australians, for all the Canadians, for four million Germans in Brazil, a million Italians in Brazil. Uh, it was an amazing opportunity that I had. But one of my workers in Canada I was visiting with, he said, Mark, you won't believe what happened. He, he teaches in our seminary, which is in Cochrane, near Calgary. And he said about a week or two before our conversation, he said, I got a phone call, uh, a Syrian. He had immigrated there about 10 years before. And uh, he called me, got my number. He said, would you come talk to me and some friends about Christianity? And, of course, <laughs> my friend said, when? And he drove about 45 minutes into Calgary. And there were seven Syrians there waiting for him. And five of them all recounted virtually the same dream. Independently, they'd had it. And the dream was basically a man in white raiment, glowing, brighter than the sun, who identified himself as Jesus and said, follow me. Five of them. And they said, we don't understand. And so, of course, our missionary opened God's word and it led all seven. Two of them didn't have the vision, but they were curious. And uh, all seven came to faith the first time they actually heard the gospel explained. And there's a new church there because of them. No, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, as Paul wrote in his prologue to the Romans. Palm branches, the sign of victory. If you're feeling down this day, if you're maybe in trials, maybe greater than you've ever experienced, don't forget the gospel's powerful and the gospel's victorious. This isn't the end. You may be in a difficult chapter, but it's not the last chapter. There is one still yet to be written. In the verse 11, we read, And all the angels were standing around the throne. Now again, you probably know that the word angel literally means messenger. And so again, we see in Scripture an angel comes to Mary, to Joseph, uh, to Zechariah. Uh, again, we, we see in Revelation the angels pouring out vials, they're blowing trumpets, they're holding back the wind. But it says here, all are present and accounted for. All the angels. There's no place else to be. This is history's culmination. This is the climactic moment. And all of them are gathered around the throne. What do they do? I believe they do what we'll all do instinctively. It says they fell on their faces before the throne and worship God. Uh, people ask me, because I spent most of my adult life overseas, uh, coming back to the States, you know, has anything changed? Uh, that, that would take a while for me to catch you up on all that I've seen in my lifetime. Uh, one thing I wasn't prepared for two years ago, I, I didn't realize Americans were so fearful. 
Uh, that was before the pandemic. Now just add the pandemic. People are afraid. Uh, and, and, and I don't see a difference. Actually, people in the church and those outside the church, just fear just seems to grip so many. Uh, but what I would say probably number one is, is I don't hear nor see much on the doctrine of holiness. That God is holy. Now we throw the word out. We sometimes sing the songs. But we, we treat God too often, I will say, as, quote, the man upstairs, as the, the old grandfather uh, I saw someone post on social media the other day and said, you know, the sun is, and I don't remember, 90-something million miles away, and we won't look at it because of the brightness of it. And yet the one that created the sun will enter his presence without any thought of his holiness. No, God is holy. God is not a better version of us. Now, someone once said that uh, God created man in his image and we've returned the favor. But God is holy. Holy. And, and to say that, that means when we're in the presence of God, it's not a negotiation. It's not, I'll consider that. It's yes, Lord. It says the angels fell on their faces. How much more so sinful man and women. Uh, again, a story out of Indonesia, uh, the most populous Muslim country in the world. This was several years ago. Uh, one of our workers there is, is a, an agricultural worker. And uh, even years earlier, he'd gone to one of the islands and done an agricultural project. And through that, met many farmers, was able to share the stories of the gospel. And many came to faith. Well, five, six, seven years transpired, and they contacted him and said, would you come again for another project? He said, I will, but on one occasion, or or one condition, that you will tell the stories when we gather in the evenings. And they agreed. And so he showed up, and on that first Monday, they did this project to increase the crop yield. And on Monday night, they gathered in the biggest place they could find. And there are probably 16, 18 farmers there together. And they're about to begin, and unexpectedly and uninvited, a member of Al-Qaeda, the, uh, the terrorist organization, walks into the room and sits down in the front. Well, the, uh, the local farmer got the eye of the missionary and nodded to go outside. And he, and he asked him, he said, what, what do we do? I know this man. He is with Al-Qaeda. And uh, this wise missionary said, well, what do you think we should do? And the man said, I think I should tell the stories. He said, let's do it. And they prayed. And they went back in. And the man began that, the, the story set, Creation to Christ, on Monday night. He, they, they worked Tuesday and came back together for the stories on Tuesday night. Al-Qaeda's back. Wednesday night, same thing. Thursday night's the last night, and he gets to the cross and the resurrection. And when he finishes, and Al-Qaeda had been there taking notes, hasn't spoken for those four nights. And the man gave an invitation, and virtually every farmer came to faith that was there. And and they're about to close, thinking, well, maybe this wasn't so bad. And finally, the Al-Qaeda rep said, wait, just a minute. I've got to know, is this true? And this farmer, uneducated, fearful, poor, trembling said sir it's all true and the man said well I want to know such a God who gave his son and loves me so much and right there he prayed to receive Christ when he opened his eyes he looked at the farmer and said you're going to the village with me now because they've never heard and when Al-Qaeda says you're going to the village you actually are going to the village and so uh, he got into the car with the Al-Qaeda guy and they drove not that far to his village, and it was already dark at that time, and so he sent a couple boys out, and he said, go round up every home in the village and come to the square, and uh, within 10 minutes, everybody in that village was gathered, and again, it was already dark, and they had the headlights on the car, and he said, everybody listen up, listen to what this man is going to tell us, and this uneducated farmer began to just share the gospel message, and many right then came to faith. And the story goes on that the Al-Qaeda man is no longer with Al-Qaeda because he's pastoring the church in his village. No one had to tell him, now, now sir, you, you might want to think about eventually talking to your family about Jesus. And, and maybe you could have a strategy and, and maybe next holiday you could like gather the village. He couldn't go to sleep that night because he possessed something that no one in his village possessed. And that was the good news of Jesus Christ. The holiness of God overwhelmed him, and he said, he is worthy. I must share now, not thinking what it may cost him when the other Al-Qaeda representatives realized the step that he took. 
Well, all of that's overseas, but what about here in the States? Again, unexpectedly, the Lord led us back to greater Houston, to Missouri City. About 125 years ago, I don't know what part of Missouri, but some of your uh, co-inhabitants came, and uh, they started this. Back then, it was outside of Houston. Houston's grown, and they started Missouri City, and they actually recruited people from Missouri. So I don't know. I at least work with the descendants, some of them, of uh, your great state, and uh, the the. Missouri City is 43% African-American and then an uh, equal number of, of Anglos and uh, Hispanics and then a smaller number of Asians. And so uh, I'm the only white guy on staff. I've got two African-Americans and, and a an, um, Hispanic guy, young guys, about the age of my kids. And, uh, and we are having a ball reaching this community. And uh, the three non-negotiables for our new church, we are gospel-centered and uh, that should go without saying, but there are a lot of churches that think that the gospel is so old-fashioned, we've got to change it to make it attractive. There's nothing wrong with the gospel, my friend. The, the, the only problem sometimes is we're not bold enough to share it. Uh, so we're gospel-centered. We're ethnically diverse. And again, it's not trying to make a statement. It's trying to reach the community. And third, we're community-focused. And so we have a, the last faith-based free medical clinic in Houston is in our activities center. Uh, every Thursday, we have food distribution. Cars come through. We put groceries in the back. And as we give them groceries, we, we say, if you would like prayer, you go around the corner and there's a prayer station. And about 40% of those who stop to get groceries will stop. And we have people in English and Spanish who will pray with them. And uh, we have ESL, English as a second language, every Tuesday night. We have a GED class for those who dropped out of school. We've been invited into the middle school, it's a quarter of a mile. It's a Title I school. 87% of the kids are under the poverty rate. And they gave us a room on campus. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, our church goes to the campus, and we open the doors. And uh, during lunch, uh, the, a teacher will release or come with anywhere from 70 to 90 kids, and we'll give out over 1,000 items of, uh, of food or, or toiletries or, or school supplies that they need. And that's how we're impacting our community. Let me tell you about one of the ladies. She lives eight doors down from the church. She moved several months ago, uh, had not found a church, and she actually saw our sign, free food, which is English and Spanish, comida gratis. And uh, she, she drove through, and we put food in her trunk. We said, can we pray with you? And when one of my associates prayed with her, he said, uh, do, do you have a church? And she said, no. And he said, well, on Tuesday nights, just around the corner, one of our four community groups meet. Would you, would you want to come? And she did. And he teaches the Tuesday night group. She came on that Sunday. Two Sundays later, she joined the church. The next Tuesday, she was in the middle school helping give out these items to these middle school students. That's the way the body works. As people receive, they want to give. Another family, we, we were going door to door. It was actually a year ago, so October of last year. We launched in January. But October, uh, we had a launch team of about 25, so probably 12, 14 of us came together on a Saturday, paired up, just went door to door to say, there's going to be a new church. What would you like to see in a new church? Uh, how can a church meet your needs? We heard all kinds of things. But uh, one of our pairs got to a lady's house, knocked on the door. A uh, lady answered the door. Her name's Melissa. And uh, she began to tear up. And she said, oh, my family needs help. She said, after 20 years, my, my husband left several months ago. I'm raising three kids plus a foster kid who was a senior in high school, four kids. And she says, I'm at the end of my rope. I don't know what to do. And so uh, they gave me the card, and my wife and I have followed up and visited and had prayer with Melissa and her kids. And uh, they started in January when we started the church. And her daughter is a fifth grader. And there one Sunday in Sunday school community group, at the end of the, serve, uh, the, end of the study, uh, our teacher there uh, just shared the, the plan of salvation with about eight or nine kids. And uh, that day, Alana bowed her head and prayed. And the, the teacher told me that uh, Alana wanted to talk with me. And so I sat down with her and her with her mom, went through the plan of salvation, and she understood. And yet the Lord just spoke to my heart to say, set another appointment. So I said, I want you to pray. I want you to think. In three weeks, I want you to come back. But I want you to bring your dad. I had no idea. But uh, three weeks later, she and her dad and her mom walked in. We sat down again. I went through the same plan of salvation, not so much for her, but for her dad. And uh, he was listening. And I led her through the sinner's prayer just to nail down and to be sure. And as we opened our eyes, her dad was weeping. And he could barely choke out the words, I need to do this as well. 
And so uh, he followed through with the gospel. Two weeks later, I baptized a fifth grade girl and her dad. And her mom was struggling, and it was about two months later she came to faith. I baptized her. And the week I baptized the mom, the dad moved back in. And uh, now the family is whole again. And they're every, every time the doors open, they're there, and they're finding their place to serve. Now, she didn't use the words, but she would have said when my wife and I prayed with her the first time, I want to be found. I, too, want to be found. And from there are people in Springfield that they want to be found. And you may be the one. Well, preacher, you know, I'm, I'm an electrician. I'm a school teacher. I'm retired. I'm a CEO. I'm a lawyer. I'm a doctor. You know what? You still may be the one that needs to go and to just share the simple truth of the gospel. Whether you're in Missouri City or Missouri, people need to know Jesus. And my prayer this morning is that maybe the Spirit has reminded you of that. Maybe we've become complacent. And maybe just maybe this morning, God would say it's time again to leave the 99 and go the one. Would you pray with me? And Father, I do thank you that many, many years ago, someone came to me with the gospel. And Father, I know that the gospel comes to us on the way to someone else, and I pray that we would not hoard it, but Lord, we would share it freely. Lord, thank you for this church who is supporting our church so many, many miles away. And thank you, Lord, for their vision here locally in their Jerusalem and their Judea and their Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. And I pray this morning just maybe a simple reminder that we are on task until that great day arrives and we'll be fitted for our robe and we'll stand with the angels to worship you. Father, take this time of invitation. I pray that you'll speak clearly and that you'll hear from our hearts and our lips a simple yes. And I pray in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand. Uh, This is a time of invitation. This altar is open. There'll be staff members here if you'd like to go. If you need to move your membership to this church, I'm sure they would love to speak with you about that step as well. But this altar is open. You come if the Lord is leading.
shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be grateful, Lord, that we can be called yours forever if we've repented of our sin, turned our face toward Jesus, and walk in line with his desires and wills for our life. God, I pray this morning that, that even in that gospel invitation, if there's one that just was hesitant to move forward, white-knuckling it on the front of the pew, Lord, I pray that you will just... Um, Convict their, their souls continually, God, until they get that right. And, Father, help them to, uh, to be brave and bold to make a decision for Jesus. We love you. It's in your great name we pray. Amen. You guys. Hey, Second Family. Tabitha and I are here to share with you about some upcoming special events that we have. Tiny Towns Fall Festival is on Thursday, October 21st. Mm. It will be in the West parking lot and we're gonna have lots of fun. Pumpkins, hay rides. We would love to see our preschool families there at that event. You can RSVP to me, Tabitha, at secondbaptist.org. That sounds so fun. Well, for our second women and women in our community, there is still time to get your ticket for Fresh Ground of Faith. That's our Kingdom First Women's event on November 5th and 6th. You will experience truth that meets you right where you are as Dove award-winning recording artist, Nicole C. Mullen, and award-winning country recording artist, Jody Messina, and our girlfriend, Jennifer Rothschild, will be in the house. We do not want you to miss it. You can contact us here at the church office or email marta at secondbaptist.org for more information about getting your ticket. We hope to see you at these upcoming events. 